It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 314 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 28th of October 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And today we're going to look at the successful repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. We're going to talk about why dung beetles have worms on their genitals, the sad plight of killer whales, and why male gorillas love hanging around children. But first, you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. You can choose your level of support, which gets you different rewards. We're really grateful to all the listeners who help us out. We couldn't do it without that support. But let's start off with the Hubble Space Telescope. And Lucas, on our last episode, we talked about how it was in trouble and we just heard that uh, one of the gyroscopes had failed and they were desperately trying to get a uh, backup one back up and running and it wasn't successful at the time has there been an update yes uh and you may have by the time you listen to this you've probably seen a whole lot of uh headlines as the worldwide media very quickly jumps on the oh just like a computer turn it off and on again (laughs) and it will work um kind of sort of not entirely there was a bit more to it than that um so just to recap very briefly on on what had gone wrong um the the um gyro wheels in the hubble space telescope uh as indeed any other probe uh have got an expected lifetime so the gyro wheels that um the scope has been running for the last uh year 80 months or so uh are kind of they're expected to fail around sometime during that time. And in fact, they've got about six months past their expected lifetime. So that was, that was good. Um, but they had been starting to exhibit problems and then, then there was a failure. So the team decided to switch over to one of the newer backup wheels, which had been installed in the last Hubble servicing mission. And although the new wheel came online, it wasn't working properly. Basically, it was lying. It was, or rather, the sensors that tell Hubble how fast the thing is running were lying. So it meant that they couldn't properly calibrate and they couldn't turn it. And it was a problem. So they dropped it back to safe mode and they've caught up on on the previous episode. (laughs) Um, So what they had decided to do now was basically a bit of a a mix of uh, the turn it off and turn it on again with uh, like an etch-a-sketch of pick it up and shake it because they pretty much just, um, you know, shook the scope (laughs) whilst whilst starting it to see whether that would dislodge what they felt must have actually been a mechanical issue and it appears to have worked. They jiggled it around a bit. So basically when your space telescope fails, you should first turn it off and on again Mm. and if that doesn't work, turn it off and on again whilst giving it a bit of a shake. Yep. And then uh, you, you might be okay. So they're okay now. Everything's so good. We're it is fine. just like with a computer. You turn it off and on again, you give it a shake, maybe a kick a few times and hope yes. it works. <laughs> Although with computers, you also are required to swear at them. That's, uh, I mean, you know, it's you don't think there was much swearing happening at NASA Mission <laughs> Control? <laughs> <laughs> I think there might have been a Surely few not. choice words. <laughs> So it sort of uh, coincides with we've had, uh, obviously, as I mentioned last episode, we, we've also had Kepler go down again. They, they think Kepler's basically out of commission now. Um, and also the Chandra um, X-ray telescope has, is having gyro wheel problems as well. So it's, it's the month of gyro problems, it seems. Yeah. Um, do we know what the actual long-term plan for Hubble is? Because um, I think they're not... Obviously, we can't service it anymore, but it's going to run out of fuel eventually. They do have to keep um, lifting it out of the way of things, don't they? Yeah, I, I, th- I think the, the intention is that it will overlap with James Webb mm-hmm. if and when James Webb ever launches. Um, so James Webb now looking at around 2020 launch, something like that. So I say something like that because it freaking changes constantly. <laughs> it's, it's constantly drifting. 
Um, so I don't know how long it will take to get James Webb actually deployed and in position and doing its thing, but uh, Hubble uh, is basically they're going to keep operating it until until they can no longer do so. So as you as you mentioned, because of its orbit, it does decay. So they do have to make uh, adjustments to its orbit. They have also occasionally to move it around for um, expected collisions with other space junk. Um, so there's you know th there is a fuel usage that's that's involved with Hubble. But it's not much. It's not like, you know, Cassini or something like that where, you know, there was a very definite amount of fuel that, uh, that they had that they, you know, that really put an outer edge on the, on the, um, on the mission. It, it, it's, um, it's not like it uses a great deal of fuel. So, yeah, we'll see. I think it's uh, as long as it doesn't have more gyro problems mm. because the reality is, as we know, when, when, they, when they retired their space shuttle program, that was it. There was no more servicing possible for Hubble because we just don't have anything that can get to its spot in orbit to uh, to do a servicing mission, nor do we have anything that has an arm to grab onto it. Um, you know, it really was designed with the space shuttles in mind. So, so yeah, we'll wait and see. But that also means in terms of planning, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, if anything fails, then it fails. And Hubble's going to be up there until its orbit decays and it isn't anymore, really. You can't just send a shuttle up and grab it anymore. So That's right. I'm looking at yep, Wikipedia absolutely. page and it's saying based on solar activity and atmospheric drag or lack thereof, a natural atmospheric re-entry for Hubble will occur between 2028 and 2040. So I guess the plan is to keep operating it as a science uh, instrument as long as they can, as long as they have the funds for it. And yeah. when it no longer works, it no longer works and you just let it yeah, fall down they, eventually. I think the expected lifetime at the moment, they, they do expect it to last out through the end of 2020. So it should overlap with James Webb if James <laughs> Webb sticks to the current uh, time frame. But uh, it's quite possible it won't. But I guess you've also got to bear in mind that we've, we've, got, we've got a hell of a lot more telescope power on land now. And with adaptive optics, adaptive optics I should say, um, we can do a lot of things that were really only possible with space-based telescopes before. Because even once James Webb's up, um, James Webb's not an optical telescope. It's, it's in the infrared. So... Um, you know, that, that's not like a, a direct replacement for it. We simply won't have a space-based optical telescope that's doing what, what we, we know Hubble's been doing all this time. But as I say, a lot of its niche is now being quite well filled by, by uh, you know, Earth-based telescopes with, with incredible, incredible adaptive, adaptive optics. <laughs> it's a hard thing to say, isn't it? to say <laughs> at this time of the evening. And of course, we should remember that there are a number of even more powerful optical telescopes under construction expected to be completed in the next decade or so, which will be even more yes. impressive. They're going to run out of adjectives, though. <laughs> no, they won't. Of... Yeah, the superlatives. <laughs> the really, 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 really big telescope. <laughs> Ridiculously huge telescope. Yeah. They yeah. will always find ways to name things, and we will always a mock serious them amount of it. telescope. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, Penny, and I'm going to be honest with you, I never thought I'd say this sentence. <laughs> Tell us about the dung beetles and the worms on their genitals. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really like this story because it is just another story that makes you think a bit differently about how animals live and sort of by extension how we live. And we, you know, we like to be think of ourselves as individuals and so on, but we all know that there are so many other um, you know, gut bacteria and so on. The gut microbiome is such a big thing now that we're really starting to, if not understand it, understand its importance. But this isn't about us. This is about dung beetles. So to, um, to breed dung beetles, you need cow dung and you make, need to make a little, a little brood ball of um, cow dung. So in the wild, the mother dung beetle will lovingly prepare it for her young and lay an egg on it. Um, this can also be done in the lab. So um, this research was done when it was noticed that the artificial brood balls are full of nematode worms. Um, so nematodes are not related to earthworms, even though they're called worms. They're a completely different group of animals. Um, and they're well, often parasitic. They? Yeah, microscopic. They're really little. So they're often parasitic. So if you see them, it's usually bad news. Um, but what they found was that these 
the the dung beetles who um, the larvae who grew in a ball infected with sorry I said infected you know with also had nematodes living in it. Infested. Infested. I don't know. That's I feel those word. are such negative words, and I don't want to use these <laughs> negative words. Populated. Populated. Thank you. <laughs> Populated with nematodes actually grew bigger um, than ones that were grown when the nematodes had been frozen out. So that's really interesting. It seems to have been beneficial to the the dung beetle larvae to have these nematodes. The nematodes live in, as Ed said, on dung beetle genitals. Uh, they like moisture. They like little sheltered crevices, and uh, genitals provide that. So um, that's a great place for them to travel on the beetle. It also means that they're really easily spread um, sexually, but also when mothers um, lay their eggs on the brood balls. Mm-hmm. So the implications of this is not just oh, okay well you know these nematodes are living in the brood balls and it somehow makes the larvae bigger it could be because um they change the bacterial community that lives in that brood ball it could be that um they have their own gut microbiomes that influence the community and um they might be putting out chemicals that change which bacteria and which don't but what I really liked is this idea that like an animal is not just an animal. This story is a bit different to our usual kind of gut bacteria stories because it's in this like it essentially a somewhat symbiotic kind of relationship. It's an animal passing on another animal to live with its young. So not just eating it, but the the nematode is definitely not a bacterium, it's another complex animal. Um so it's a bit different from I think the other examples that were talked about was you know ka- koalas passing on their eucalyptus digesting digesting bacteria mm. to their joeys or tsetse flies um, giving their grubs a microbe wish rich fluid to help them um, develop or even when human mothers give birth often you know this this new this idea coming out is that that the, the um, bacteria that they encounter in their vagina are really important for that sort of first rush of um gut flora but it so, sounds like yeah. it, it is very similar to those examples though uh, and even the gut in our own uh, the bacteria in our own gut this is a symbiotic relationship that yeah we as humans have with our guts and the same sort of thing may be happening with the uh, nematodes and the dung beetles yeah and look it is really similar but it's really different because it's another animal which i think is really cool and it's also not always the case so um not every dung beetle has them. Um, ah. So who knows, like, what environments it's beneficial in or if it's not or if it's just random chance or so on. So I think it's um, I think it's really interesting. I liked that it made me think about um, – I think what the word they used was holobiont. I've never heard it before. Holobiont, which is thinking of a the, an animal and the community of creatures that share its life. So, you know, we wouldn't last too long, I don't think, mm-hmm. without our bacteria and our sort of ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. It sort of makes me think of like, um, you know, the blue bottle, the jellyfishes that mm. are actually three animals yeah. uh, as one sort of thing. There's the, the sail, there's the actual neuro bit, and then there's the stingers. They're all actual three separate animals. Separate animals. animals. Yeah. That's kind of cool thing to think about. Yeah, I, I like thinking about that. I think, as I'll talk about later as well, there's a lot of sort of um, conceptions that we bring into our thought about life and animals that it can be kind of hard to see, you know, is that saying like the fish can't see the water. Yeah, and to think of animals as individuals is maybe holding us back in some ways from understanding how they how things really work. So I think this is kind of cool. Essentially, what you're saying is the hippies were right. Everything's connected, Yeah, it's connected, all connected, man. man. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, Lucas, something less awesome. Uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, better known as PCBs, are industrial chemicals that have been banned in most countries for decades. 
but they're actually seeping into the oceans and they're likely to have a dramatic consequence for orcas and probably lots of other marine mammals, aren't they? Yeah, so orcas obviously are uh, top level predators. So if you look at the uh, you look at the the whole food web, if you like, they're they're right at the top. And one of the downsides of that is that it tends to be the top level predators who are most affected by toxins that are able to be absorbed into fat. And of course, whales blubber. They've got fat. They need it as a part of their thing. They store energy in it. It keeps them warm. So orcas actually do store PCBs in their fat. Now, going stepping back for a moment, PCBs, obviously, we haven't had PCBs in, in common use for a few decades now. In the, in basically, um, you know, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, work that was done in the, in the sort of 80s and 90s and so forth that they, um, it, it became quite clear that PCBs were, were quite damaging to, to the environment, to the ecosystem. Um, but they were very, very popular prior to that because they're very stable, which is the reason they hang around. They're very heat resistant. They're, they're electrically insulating. So they're really, really good to use for things like you know, lubricants and adhesives and coolants, flame retardants and that sort of thing and other, other various industrial uses. So that's, um, you know, the, the, the very same things that make them popular and, and preferable for, for use also have made them stick around for a very long time. So even though we, were, we found them to be toxic, um, we, we, did, uh, we did ban their use. They basically have still continued to leach into the environment. So a lot of these things have ended up in landfill. Um, and in landfill, there's always risk of, uh, of seepage as things break down. The PCBs then basically are freed and they can make their way into waterways and water tables and so forth. And of course, eventually into the oceans. So scientists have been watching the levels of PCBs for about thirty odd years, and what they found was that um, even though they've been waiting for like thirty five plus years um, since the PCB ban, um, in that time they've not seen that the PCBs have declined in concentration. If anything, they've continued to to increase in population in in animals such as orcas, um, they've started to level off now, which is which is good. But when you look at the lifespans of, of the orcas, um, it pretty much means that the current generations of orcas that are out there are going to have this problem for their entire lives. Now, how does it affect them? It has a it seems to have quite an effect on their reproduction. So when orcas are already under pressure because of declining food stocks. Um, that alone is probably not enough to have a significant impact on their populations, at least at the current levels. But when they've got multiple stresses, like they do with these PCBs in the mix, it's had quite a, a significant effect on some of the um, some of the populations of orcas around the world. So some of the populations they think are actually going to completely disappear. So they said that the eight of the most heavily exposed populations, heavily exposed to PCBs, are likely to disappear, which are orcas from Greenland, Canary Islands, uh, Hawaii, Japan, Brazil, Gibraltar and the UK. Um, so, and there's two more uh, populations, the Alaskan transients and southern residents. Um, basically, they'll be less uh, affected, but they are expected to decline quite significantly so in terms of the impact on their reproduction so in apparently in many of these populations mis miscarriages are very very common so and and a lot of the newborn calves also often often die unfortunately because these pcbs are fat soluble not only are they stored in the blubber they're also passed on in the milk from the mothers mm. to the to the calves so the calves then become the the mothers can actually offload up to 70 percent of their pcb load to their calves um, so it has a you know significant effect on them as well. So as an example, the southern residents apparently haven't had a surviving newborn since 2015, and the UK population hasn't had one for 25 years. Whoa! So you can imagine the impact that's going to have with no replenishment. Plus, they're under pressure from um, from from loss of uh, food stocks. Uh, this is quite a, a big impact that can have on them. So after the bans, uh, you know, which were back in the 70s and 80s, basically, you know, although the chemicals have, have, have stopped increasing now, which is great, um, they're, still, they're still out there and there's still equipment and materials that are in use 
that were produced in the 60s and 70s. Um, look at aircraft, for example. There's, there's aircraft around that are over 50 years old that are still flying. Um, so we, we, have, we have a lot of chemicals in, in factory equipment and other you know, materials manufacturing and all sorts of things out there that are still there. It's also in paints and other materials. So, uh, so there's still a lot of PCBs that are going to make their way into uh, the oceans if they're, not, you know, if they're not got rid of properly. So it's not looking great for the, for the orcas with, with respect to, to PCBs. It's difficult to know exactly what will happen because it's not like they can just take orcas and stick them in a lab and kind of expose them to PCBs and see what happens to them. So as a result, they tend to rely on analogs. And, and one of the analogs for this is actually minks, which uh, like mink coats, the, the yeah. minks that are little semi-aquatic a- animals that are also predators. They eat fish. Apparently, there's been studies on those that, that show them um, what the what the um, buildup can can look like. Um, so where to go from here? Well, they're not really sure. Unfortunately, um, it's it's looking like the uh, as I say, this generation particularly, or the current generations of killer whales are going to have to deal with this their whole lives. Um, we don't know whether the concentrations are going to uh, affect other populations because it may well be. If you consider the way it gets into them, it's coming into them from the very, very lowest level. It's basically these things are eaten by um, by plankton and crustaceans and so forth, which then all the way up the food chain are eaten by other animals. So if the food stocks are collapsing in certain areas, then it may well be that other areas that currently don't have the competition pressures, maybe there'll be a redistribution of food stocks. Mm. Who knows? It's a really, really hard thing to to put a finger on as to you know how this is going to... Um, uh, develop over time, but just to give you an idea of the the, the numbers we're we're talking about here in terms of the the amounts of of toxicity and exposure. So apparently, southern southern uh, whales, southern uh, killer whales, have got up to eighty three parts per million in in their bodies. The bigs have got between one hundred and three hundred parts per million on average. Another female uh, that died in Scotland last year had nine hundred and fifty seven parts per million. And, and, and there was one that was stranded in Washington State in 2002, which had 1,300 parts per million. And what they did find when they, when they were looking at some, some other uh, species was that as little as, you know, a couple of hundred parts per million basically had a, a significant impact on their uh, ability to have, uh, uh, to have babies. So hmm. it's not, not good news. And we've done all that we can in terms of we've banned the production and uh of the pcbs but i guess what more can we do apart from reducing the strain on um feeding grounds and everything so cut down on overfishing and uh protecting them and giving them better sort of environments to thrive in i guess is the best we can do because we can't easily clean up all these pcbs can we that, that's exactly right and you've hit the nail on the head basically the in in summary um the, and just an article by Ed Yong, in summary, they, they feel that there's really very little they can do um, about the PCB problem uh, other than ensuring that, that, that PCBs still in use don't make their way into the ecosystem, mm-hmm. other than just making sure that the other pressures on the whales are reduced as much as possible. So at least they're only having to fight a battle on one front. Yeah. Well, that was a cheery story. Yeah, there was another story which uh, wasn't in the list today, but but uh, slightly relevant was there was another whale story which was looking at some recent findings that there's been an overall decrease in whale song, particularly by baleen whales, particularly by humpback whales. Um, there were some studies done in Japan where they found that the humpbacks have pretty much just given up trying to compete with all the man-made sounds, all the shipping noises. Mm. So areas where they had commonly um, recorded these whales who use song for a variety of reasons, they use it as a part of their, their mating, finding mates and, and communicating with each other. There's all sorts of uh, important aspects of their whale song um, and to communicate with family groups and all sorts of stuff. But in these areas where there's quite heavy shipping, the baleen whales basically have just stopped singing. Um, so we're, we're impacting these creatures in so many different ways. Well done, humans. Uh. All right, Penny, let's move on and talk about male gorillas and why they just love kids so much. (laughs) 
Or do they love kids? Or do they love kids? Do they just put up with them? Well, that's the thing. And, I mean, I guess we can always put our own sort of interpretations on the behaviour of animals. But um, gorillas, who are, in fairness, quite closely related to us, you know, we're one of the great apes, just like them, um, have been observed, male gorillas have been observed to be quite affectionate towards the infants in their group who are not necessarily their own biological children. So it's not just the silverback or, you know, the oldest one that has all the babies. The younger males can also have kids as well. And it turns out that male gorillas will do things like pick infants up, groom them, get them to interact, um, tolerate it when they climb on them, cuddle them, welcome into their nests, things that we would probably describe as babysitting. Um, you know, or looking after kids. And, you know, Mm -hmm. as we were just chatting before the show, Ed was saying, oh, you know, is letting an infant climb on your back really a sign of love? And I thought, well, yeah, if it climbs on your back and you don't just get rid of it immediately, that's that's a sign of love. Like it's not the most intrinsically enjoyable (laughs) activity. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They're not not flinging them across the jungle. They're not flinging them across the jungle as like – Really, every instinct apart from your parenting instincts would mm. want you to do. <laughs> They're very terrible. <laughs> they are. Or tolerant. So, you know, this is not what you sort of think about when you think about male gorillas, you know. Um, you certainly don't think of them as being actively involved in childcare. And what was found is that the males that are the most involved with childcare or they spend the most time with infants have five times as many offspring as those that are least interested. Now, that's a huge difference. It's not like, oh, you know, it's a 120% increase, like five times. So that, is, that, yeah. is that causative or is it just a consequence of? Like well, are they the ones that are hanging around with the kids because they are the kids' fathers? Well, they're not necessarily the kids' dads because um, – Gorillas are polygamous. Can't tell them apart yeah, they, they're all, they're all <laughs> yeah, and they don't know who's been with whom and, you know, who's biologically their kid. Like, you know, we, we don't know why it is, but they are spending time with children, with infants that are not their own. So it's, it's not could it, simply, could yeah. It be, could it then be that the females are seeing these father-like figures who mm. are so good with kids that they go, of all the mates that I want to have, I want to mate with this guy because he's going to be a good father. Yeah, and that's one of the suggestions. And it's interesting too that that idea does come down to sort of female choice because that's often been neglected in biology. Um, You know, the first, well, until quite recently, science has been very male-dominated and the focus was more on male gorillas competing for mates and not really thinking about, you know, what does what does the female gorilla do in this process? What does she choose? But, yeah, it very much could be that um, female gorillas are preferentially choosing to mate with males who do spend more time with um, infants. It could be because they actually see them looking after the infants. It could be because the traits that lead a male to spend more time with infants are also independently attractive. Um mm-hmm. And it, it, it really suggests that maybe females have a lot of influence on who is the kind of um, top male gorilla. Like if they're mating with the ones that are best with in, infants, then they're, they're having a bit more input into the group structure than you might think of this kind of narrative of, oh, this male fights with that male and gets all the females. And, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. And it's interesting too, its implication for humans, be, humans because um, humans were initially probably lived in polygamous communities. A lot of societies still are. And you would really think in this kind of model that the dads wouldn't show much care. But human fathers do, like not necessarily in a hands-on, sensitive, new age guy kind of way, but um, human fathers are generally held to be responsible for their offspring. They might provide financial care or resources, if not, you know, hands-on parenting, which a lot of human fathers do do. Like they have an important role in raising their children and have across cultures. So, um yeah, I, I always like a story that's, um, oh, look, you know, so like us. 
Yeah. I, like, I really yeah. like this, this uh, particular quote. Um, some of the males in the study were very young and had mm. barely started fathering their own studies, yeah. and yet their attentiveness, attentiveness to other infants mm. predicted mm. their future reproductive yeah. success. Yeah. Hmm. I just love it when we get science like this that actually gets us to question our outlook on science. Like, yeah, is it exactly. that we've always assumed it was the aggressive males choosing who they partner mm. with and everything. Why did we always assume the females didn't get a choice? And I think it's great when we can turn things matter, around. And look, you know? Yeah. Or it's, it's just some stupid thing. Oh, they evolved these stupid tales because females like it for dumb female reasons, essentially. Like we couldn't possibly think of an actual reason why they would like this. It's just sexual selection. You know what I mean? Like there yeah. sort of is sometimes that kind of dismissal. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, that bias and that... Uh, and not yeah, intentional bias, but just if, if the not bulk of the research literature and stuff that you can find and quote and, you know, and it was mentioned in the article I read that, you know, Diane Fossey did write briefly about bonds between males and infant gorillas in the 70s and so did one of her students, but and few others kind of picked that up and ran with it and looked into it. They just thought, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's not important. It's just cute. It's not worth studying. Mm. Oh. But... It's interesting that it is such a significant, um, you know, evolutionary driver, I guess, because, yeah, five times as many kids. Yeah, it's, it's a yeah, huge difference. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, yes. this is cool. Yeah. I enjoyed reading it. I just noticed this is another Ed Yong story. Mm. Yeah. We do like Ed Yong stories. I story. love we, Ed We Yong. do. Like, <laughs> if I read a story and I haven't quite, I haven't checked who it was, I'm like, oh, must be Ed. Like, <laughs> even the most... Obscure <laughs> stuff, fascinating. I wish I was as yeah. talented as he is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed Yong, for your brilliant yep. writing. Exactly. And on that note, that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 314. Or you could just go to Ed Yong's Twitter feed and you'll probably find him there. <laughs> and as always, you can go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I a story I always tell is I was doing, uh, I've written a couple of books, uh, uh, SFU, and, and uh, one, one, one of the books I wrote was, was specifically about optimism. It's called Always Looking Up. And um, I was having a hard time meeting my deadlines. I'd skipped you know, past a couple of deadlines, and I was late, and I was a little stressed. Oh, and writing the book, you mean? Writing the book, and I was a little stressed because I hadn't, I hadn't got as much done as I wanted to. I said to Tracy, I'm never going to finish my book on optimism. <laughs> and she said, you know, you know, you said that a lot. Did, did you know how funny that was? Uh, no, she, I saw how funny it was when I saw her reaction. <laughs> <laughs>